Good morning, church. Good morning. Very good. Welcome to Kingsway. Super glad you're here with us today. If you're visiting with us, welcome. You picked spring break day to be here, and we're really glad you did. If you're watching at home online, which I know this kind of week is the kind of week where people travel, so they tune in online, we're still glad you're tuning in with us. If you're visiting or newer, you may not know this, but we have been in the book of Luke. We're now in chapter five. We're going slow. We're not trying to rush our way through this. Just really trying to answer that question. Who is Jesus? What did he do? How do we know? What does it mean for us? So kind of with that in mind, let's just go ahead and jump in because I got too much to say to play around on the front end. So we'll be in Luke chapter five today. So I just ask if you got a Bible, digital paper, whatever you want to use, tune there. Otherwise, we'll be using, excuse me, the screen. Luke chapter five in verse one, it says this. One day... As Jesus was standing by the Lake of Gennesaret. Now, real quick, I didn't know this till this week. The Lake of Gennesaret is the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. There you go. Little Bible factoid. You're like, you should get paid to know that for a living. You're right. I should. And now I do. Okay. So <laughs> Luke chapter five, verse one, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. This is, if I've talked about this before, but there's a TV show out right now called The Chosen. They're in season three. When they show this scene, it's one of my favorite scenes. I wrestled with whether or not to show it to you and because at the end of it, just does such a good job telling the story. Like I've watched it three times in an hour this week, decided not to use it and literally got teary-eyed all three times. So there's, but when they're showing this scene, they're showing like 10 or 15, 10 or 20 people kind of right there around Jesus. Most likely, it's a bigger crowd than that. It's not probably not thousands, but most likely, it's a bigger crowd. And they're, when it says they're crowding around him, the, the emphasis there in the Greek word is they were literally like, like, like forcing themselves almost upon him. Everybody wants to see what he's up to. Everybody wants to be a part of this miracle. Everybody wants to experience something amazing. And so they're, they're kind of pushing and, and shoving in a little bit of a way, and, and it's making it awkward for Jesus. It's hard for him to talk and answer questions and do his thing. And it says, he saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen, who were washing their nets. Now, later in this story, we will look and understand it, who the fishermen are. And what you'll find out is it's, it's Peter and Andrew, those two are brothers, James and John, those two are brothers. All four of them would become disciples, but we don't know that quite yet as the way Luke is telling the story. It's just there's two boats sitting there. Now, for those of you who are newer to Kingsway, you don't know this, but a year ago, I got to go to Israel for my first time ever. And it was a super cool trip. And uh, people keep asking me, are you gonna lead a trip for us one day? And the answer is, yeah, maybe one day when my kids are a little bit older, it takes a lot of time and energy to pull that off. And I just don't have that margin right now. Maybe someday, but there are lots of places. If you wanna go, you can go. But I thought I would show you a picture of the Sea of Galilee. So this is me on a boat. That's why it's crooked. <laughs> because the boat was moving uh, on the Sea of Galilee. Now, and I've got a lot of these. I don't know that you would notice much, but you could see kind of the, the hills in the background. You could call them mountains if you wanted, but they're not. They're like bunny hills. There's only really one major mountain in the area, but the rest of these are just the hillsides. It's beautiful. It's a Mediterranean climate, which is like California. Only three to 5% of the world is a Mediterranean climate. And I guess if you're gonna be the creator of the universe and decide to enter into that universe, you probably should pick one of the nicest climates in the world to go live there, right? And that's what Jesus did. It's absolutely beautiful, but it looks a lot like any lake you've been on, even though this is a sea, it does. It, it has that kind of feel to it. And so I just, just to come, come back to the story here, verse three, he got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. Now, you may not know this, but this is Simon, who will later be called Peter. So when you read through your Gospels, you'll see him called Simon, Simon Peter, or Peter. 
And all of those three titles are referring to the same person. Now, there are other Simons in the Bible, just like there are other Matts or, or Michaels or Marks or whatever. I don't know why I picked all M names. But um, so it may be a little confusing for you at time, but context can help you figure out who we're talking about. In this case, we're talking about Simon Peter. You know, that guy you've heard about the jokes, he's standing at the pearly gates, right? We get to heaven and there's Peter standing there. Yeah, that guy, that guy, that's the guy we're talking about here. But this is the moment, a life-changing moment where he's gonna run into Jesus. And he's going to have to wrestle with some things. Now, what's about to happen, and I'll, I'll set the stage just a little bit for you, is uh, back then they would fish all night long. There's a lot of theories about why they fished all night long. We aren't 100% sure which is right. But for one, it's not the heat of the day, it's cool. But for two, it's kind of known that fish don't necessarily have, you know, these great eyelids or whatever, and so they're their eyes need to be protected from sunlight. So at the, at the, in the evening time, and the nighttime, they come to the surface more. It has to do with the temperatures of water. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of different reasons. But they would fish at night because that was the best time to catch the most amount of fish. They didn't have the technologies and, you know, all the lures and jigs and things we have today. And they would use these large nets. And uh, the nets, there were two major kinds. There's kind of like an individual net, kind of more of a round thing. And then there was a bigger net that could take two separate groups or sometimes two boats, and they would be weighted, and they'd kind of throw it down, and the weighted part would carry it down to the deeper parts, and they'd have strings attached to pull it back up and grab the fish. And that's kind of what we're looking at in this scenario. And so as we're going to see in the story, since it was uh, already the night had passed, we're into the morning time. And so when I was in Israel, I just had this grandiose idea. Uh, somebody had suggested that you see the sunrise on the Sea of Galilee. Well, I couldn't sleep. You know, there's a time change issue and a travel issue, and I was tired and snoring roommate issue, you know, all the things. And uh, so I decided to get up and go see the sunrise. And I'm just sitting there on the Sea of Galilee, and I snapped a couple pictures. I thought I'd just share them with you. They're, they're, you know, they're like any sunrise picture, but this is the sun beginning to rise over the Sea of Galilee. And then the next one, I was talking to my wife on the phone. I called her, and, uh, and, and there was a spider trying to attack me here. Uh, I was on his turf, and he didn't like that. And, uh, and I looked over, and there was the sun rising right through this little metal thing that was, like, blocking me from the sea. And I thought, well, that's super cool. I'm just going to take a picture. And so hopefully it just helps you to understand. Guys, we're talking about a real place and a real part of the world at a real moment in time. It looked just like that in Jesus' day, probably a different spider, and there wasn't a metal grate there, right? But the whole point is it's the same sea. It's the same location. These aren't just stories made up by somebody. These are real people, real places, in a real time. Now, let's come back to what happens, because what happens on the sea is more important than my pictures of the sea themselves. Verse four. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Now, I want you to picture this in your mind, right? You've been fishing all night long. This is what you do for a living. And this guy has the audacity to tell you how to do your job better. Now, I want you to imagine that I come to your workplace tomorrow. I don't know what you do. Maybe you're a teacher or an accountant. Maybe you own a business or you're in sales. And I come and I'm just following you around all day long. And at the end of the day, you've been wildly unsuccessful in what you do. It just has not worked. You didn't close any deals. The kids weren't listening. You couldn't get your job done. And then I start telling you how to do it better. How is that going to settle with you? Anybody who's married knows exactly. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just messing around. Thank you for the really poor laugh. Maybe, maybe I'll get you on one of the next ones. All right. But here's the question. The problem Peter is facing is the same problem we face with Jesus today. Will I trust that Jesus knows more than I do? It's a tough one. Yesterday, <clears throat> my wife had, she was at a two-day conference here in town. We homeschool our kids, and it was a homeschool conference. My wife went to the conference, so I had my kids all day. So Friday, my wife, um, she had to teach me what to teach the kids because uh, apparently I'd forgotten all of it. And so I taught the kids Friday, and Saturday was just a day to play. And so I decided, since mom was gone all day, hey, we're gonna clean the house a little bit. So when she comes home, it'll just be a nice environment for her to come home to, not feel stressed or anything like that. 
So we were working, and, and the boys are asking me to tell them stories, like God stories, and I'd love to do that. And I'm not, it, I wasn't 100% sure, like, are they trying to get out of cleaning, or are they, <laughs> or they really want to hear these stories? But I didn't care. It's the perfect opportunity to share what God has been doing in, in my life for the last 46 years and, and what he might be doing in their life. So it was just fun to tell all these stories of stuff that God had done. And I know some of you guys have heard this story, so it's not new, and I'll give the shorter version that I gave last service so I can tell some other stories. But years ago, my last church was launching a second campus, and it was gonna be an $18 million second campus. And after a long, long, long story that I went through with them, I won't go through with you, they finally came to me and said, would you be our campus pastor? Now, I'd been at that church for about nine years at the time. I'd been a student pastor for a little over eight, and I loved, I loved being a student pastor. I loved working with teenagers, and I wasn't sure that I could let it go. But I finally decided I was gonna go up to the mountains and talk to God. And so I went up to the mountains before I went on a hike that day. It was roughly February of 2008. And before I went up, I went to this coffee shop up there in Estes Park, and I just wrote out all of the things I love about doing student ministry. I still have this piece of paper I found it the other day. And then I wrote out all of my fears and anxieties and worries about if I do this, what if I, what if I sin, and what if I fail, and what if I this, and what if I that, and what if I mess this thing up, and what if, what if, what if, what if, and what about the kids, and what about the students, and what about my wife, and what's the future look like, and all these fears and anxieties. I just wrote them out. And I had my list, and I was like, all right, I didn't come up here to sit in a coffee shop. I came up here to talk to God. So I went up to the mountains, and I hiked around. And it's one of the stories I told my kids yesterday. And... Um, you know, it's one of those things that happened to me, and I know it happened to me, but I have no, no picture, no video, I have no proof. I just know it happened. So you could choose to believe me or not. I honestly don't care. I know it happened to me. And after this long hike, and I just went through each of these fears and laid them out to God. What about this? What about this? What about this? And God took each of those fears, and he gave me peace about them. And one of the last ones he gave me is, I, I just remember, like, sometimes he gave me a Bible verse, but as he got the last one, I just remember just walking in silence, hiking through Rocky Mountain National Park, tons of snow everywhere, and I just said, God, it sounds like this, you want me to take this next step. And I have, no more, I have no more excuses. All of my excuses are gone. So I walked in silence, and I just wrestled with that, like, man, this is gonna be a major life change for me. And so I remember coming around this turn, and nobody was around, and this bird flew in front of me, and it landed in a tree, it was to my left, and I turned and I faced the tree, and it was maybe, I don't know, 10 feet away or so. And I had this there's, this, there's a lot of reasons why, but I had this really stupid idea. See, I hadn't seen a single animal up to that point. And I would go up to Rocky Mountain National Park to see animals, deer or elk or, or whatever. I never saw moose in 10 years, and now my friends see them all the time. I don't know what's going on. Bunny rabbits, you name it, uh, jackalopes, the whole nine yards. Like, we saw them all. And um, that's not a thing, I just made that up. Anyway, so uh, bighorn sheep, you name it. And that day I saw nothing, nothing, not one animal, not one mountain lion, thank God, but I didn't see anything. And so I turned and I looked at this bird, the first animal I saw, and I just was enjoying it for a minute. And I had this dumb idea. I said, God, if this is really what you're saying, if you really want me to do this, would you make that bird come out of that tree and land on me? And my first thought was, oh no, it might land on my head <laughs> if God does this. And so I, I slowly put my arm out to the side. And when I got my arm to about here, the bird flew out of the tree and it landed on my arm and it turned and looked at me as if to say, do you get it now, idiot? That's at least how I interpreted the message <laughs> from the bird. And I looked at the bird and it only lasted like a couple seconds and the bird flew right back into the tree and I thought, oh my goodness, did that just happen? I can't, I, did that just happen? And I thought, okay, that, that could be a fluke. Like that poor bird, there's so much snow up here. Everything is covered. That poor bird can't find anywhere to land. He's like, I'm desperate. I, I, what if I put up the other side? God, if this is true, and what went through my head is Gideon. Like literally, if you don't know the story in the book of Judges, and going, I, don't, I will not test you, God. So I just came to this conclusion like, okay, God, I am convinced this is what you're telling me to do. And I came down the mountain. I called my wife as soon as I had a reception. I said, hey, can we go to dinner at Oscar Blues, this great restaurant we loved in Lyons, Colorado, and uh, just join me there and we'll go to dinner. And we went to dinner and we talked about it. And she was like, I've already known this is what God was telling you to do. I just needed to wait for you to come to that conclusion. I'm like, thank you very much. But here's the thing. My answer was yes. What Peter says next, verse five, take a look. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night. We haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. Now, what would inspire Simon Peter to do this? Now, if you were to look at your, what we call your, your gospel books, okay? So in, in the Bible, there are four gospel books. The gospels are the good news of Jesus Christ. We've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Take John out for just a second. These three books, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we call them the synoptic gospels 
because they either had the same sources or they talked to the same sources. And scholars love to sit around and debate who wrote first and the others must have used that person who wrote first because there's so much similarity between them. But if you were to read the different gospels, sometimes you get a little nuance to the story or maybe another person's point of view or angle on what happened and what they remember if you read the synoptics. John is literally doing his own thing. Like if you read John, he's got a different order to things. He's all over the place because he's trying to write a theological book and it is one of the most beautiful, beautifully written, so amazingly crafted books you'll ever find. But when you go read these other books, like when you read John, you find out that Simon Peter's first interaction with Jesus is not here. Simon Peter, in fact, um, earlier, those guys, remember James and John and then Simon and Andrew, like they had had interactions with a guy named John the Baptist or John the Baptizer. We talked about him a few weeks back if you wanna go back and listen. And when John the Baptist, he had disciples, he had followers who were learning his ways and teachings. And one day John the Baptist was like, that guy, that guy right there, he's pointing at Jesus. He goes, here is the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. I must decrease, he must increase, go follow him. And Andrew is one of those guys. Andrew is Simon Peter's brother. He's one of the four guys that are there this day in Luke 5. And Andrew, it says in John, he runs over, he goes to Peter, he's like, come here, you gotta meet the one that we've been told about. You gotta meet the prophesied one, the Messiah. He's here, he's here, you gotta meet him. So somewhere between that story in John and this story in Luke, Peter has already heard some things about Jesus. He's already known some things. But even more than that, excuse me for a second. This thing is driving me crazy. Try to quit playing with it and just fix it. Ah, that's better for everybody. Okay, so prior to this, in the end of Luke chapter four, if you just go back one chapter where we were last week, you may remember that Jesus went to Simon's house and healed his mother-in-law. She was deathly ill, and Jesus called the fever out of her, and she is totally, wholly complete, and she starts serving everybody breakfast. Now, if you weren't there, I'm just filling you in on what happened last week. I was talking to my wife about the sermon yesterday, last night when she came back from the conference, and she goes, maybe that's why Peter went out on the boat all night. I was like, oh, maybe, maybe. You know, his mother-in-law was, nobody? <laughs> you could text your mother-in-law and say, I love you. I didn't laugh at his dumb joke. Okay. <laughs> but I did get a few more of you that done than the last time. All right. So the, the thing that we know is that Peter's first interaction is not this moment where Jesus goes, hey, let me in your boat. Let me do some teaching. Put your nets up. That's not his first interaction. He's seen Jesus do some things. You with me? He's seen some things. But what does he do? Notice what he did. He said, Because you say so. These are five crazy, powerful words. Words that will change the trajectory of your life if you say them. I'm just telling you right now. You will see God do amazing things. You will testify and tell stories for decades to come if you will just repeat those five words. I don't understand how it's gonna work. I don't have enough resources. I don't have the margin of my time. I don't know enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not wise enough. I don't have the resource, whatever it is. But if you will say, God, because you say so, God will show off his power. I know this. (laughs) This February, 14 years ago, if 14 years ago, I hadn't gone on a hike to the mountains and had a hard conversation with God. God, I don't have enough resources. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm gonna mess the whole thing up. What if I sin? What if I, you know, the whole thing's gonna fall apart. What about these students? Who's gonna love them? Who's gonna take care of them? What about my future? I don't know where this is gonna go. I got all these questions, God. I need answers, God. And if God hadn't showed up and said, I got it, 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 I got it. And I got you. I got it and I got you. Trust me. If I hadn't done that 14 years ago, I wouldn't be standing here today. Because it was because I accepted that job that I began to speak a little bit more publicly at my last church that when this church was looking for who might be their next senior pastor, they decided to find a video of a guy in Colorado who had only just started in the position a few months before. And if I hadn't said yes, I wouldn't be here. And that's the thing about God. It's each yes leads to the next thing that God wants to do. But you may never find out what God wants to do if you don't say your first yes. It's your bold yes in the midst of the questions, in the midst of the fear, in the midst of the confusion that leads to God's faithfulness and provision. He says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Never with God means never. 
You can trust him. Luke 5, verse 6. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. (laughs) So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. Can you imagine that? This is their best, most successful day. It went from complete failure to complete success because Jesus said so. It's that simple. What we take away from this story is Jesus is showing his authority over all creation. And he will do this many, many, many times. But what he's doing in the life of Peter and Andrew and James and John is so much bigger than fish. It's so much bigger than fish. But these guys went from unsuccessfully struggling all night long to having this amazing moment of success. Amazing moment. They just got to see Jesus do a miracle. You don't fish in the middle of the day or in the middle of the morning and catch anything. Nobody succeeds. You can't do it. But because you said so, I'll do it anyway. And they do. And they win. Now, I want you to imagine for a minute, you just had your biggest day ever, your best day ever. You had your biggest sale, your biggest financial win, whatever it is. You just had the most amazing day at work in the history of the world. And you go home and you can't, like you're telling your best friend, your spouse, your parent, your children, whoever it is that you share your life with, you're telling them all about it. And what happens next happens to you. Ready? When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. And then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on shore and left everything and followed him. I want you to imagine you just had your greatest, most successful day in the history of your particular work, whatever it is. And Jesus said, I'm going to make you something bigger and better and different than you ever imagined. Could you walk away from all of it to follow See, it's messages like this from texts like this that when I was a a young man, 16 to 18 years old, I had this amazing dream. I I was gonna have this really nice car and this big white house with a white picket fence and two and a half kids, the perfect American dream, right? We rounded up, we did get that part. But, um... I just thought, yeah, this is what I'm gonna go after. I'm gonna chase this, I'm gonna get it. I'm gonna be happy and successful. And then one day through texts just like this, God said to me, Matt, I want to do something different with your life than what you can now see and envision. Will you trust me to work out your life according to my plan and not your own? And that took me a long time, a long time. But it was messages like this from texts like this that made me go, maybe God wants to do something that I can now see or envision. And I just wanna throw this out there, even though it's not the focus of today's text. Some of you, God is gonna end up calling into full-time ministry. And if I don't say it because we come to a text like this, you won't have the thought in your head. And you just need to start thinking about it. You need to start letting God mess with you. One of the things I love about being the pastor at Kingsway is the vast majority of our staff are not classically trained Bible college students. Many of them were, were wise, godly men and women who are different fields, a variety of fields, I mean, we only have maybe a handful or so of people on our staff who went off to a Bible college, got a Bible college degree. Now, many of them have gotten it since then, but they were just godly men and godly women who saw an opportunity to serve where there was a need and said, I'll step in. And I love that about our church. We want to keep hiring from within. So many of our elders and and life group leaders and, and leaders in our students and kids ministries, you guys are godly men and women. You've been trained in God's word sometimes for decades. Some of you are pastor's kids or, or elder's kids from other churches, the church you grew up in, and God's continuing to leave a legacy behind. And I love it, I love it. But I just, my great fear is that sometimes we'll come to a text like this and we'll think this is about somebody else for somewhere else and not about me. So while I realize not everybody here is gonna end up in full-time paid ministry, I do need to throw that out. Some of you might, and you need to just start letting God work on you because it usually doesn't happen in a moment. It happens over a period of time. And let this be the first seed God plants in your heart. But for everybody else, one of my great fears as your pastor is that one day you're gonna stand before Jesus and have wasted 
your life. There's a book by a guy named John Piper. And John Piper, uh, in his book, it's called Don't Waste Your Life. It came out of, he was asked to do a sermon in front of a bunch of college-age students. And I was gonna show it, but the, the, the video quality is terrible and it takes a while to set it up and you should go look it up on YouTube later. But in it, he's giving this passion sermon to these college students saying, don't waste your life. And he gives this illustration. He had just had um, these two older missionary ladies who, ladies who in their retirement age, they went off to the mission field and their brakes gave out and they drove off a cliff and died. And the talk in his church was how, how sad and tragic and terrible it was. These ladies' life was wasted. And he stood up before his church and said, wasted, wasted. They didn't waste their life. They were waking up every day to the glory of God to give their lives away to others. It, it ended tragically, but they didn't waste it. They didn't waste it. He said, a waste. He said, about that same time, I, I opened up a newspaper and I read the story about this amazing couple who retired. And in their retirement years, they retired early and they moved down to Florida. And every day they wake up and they walk on the beach and this, see these beautiful sunrises and they collect these seashells. He's like, that's a waste of a life. He's like, what are you gonna do when you get to heaven? Are you gonna take a pile of seashells to Jesus and say, look what I found? He made them and put them there. He's not gonna be that impressed. <laughs> and it's easy for us to chuckle, but it's also easy for us to get sucked into the American dream. Don't get me wrong. There's no nation on the earth that I would rather live unless Jesus told me to and I had to say, because you say so. Yeah, whatever you ask, it's your life. You do what you want with my life. Because I don't know about you, but I'm sitting there yesterday, I'm talking to my boys and I'm telling them story after story. I remember this time, you guys have heard most of my stories. I remember this time with this. I remember this time with Mr. Steve, our friend. I remember this time with our furnace. I remember this time and I'm telling them story after story. And they're like, tell us more, tell us more. And again, I'm not sure they didn't just want to clean, but I didn't care. I was eating up the moment. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. And they're like, more, more, more. My nine-year-old looks at me and he goes, dad, why do you have all these awesome stories and I don't have any? I said, oh, you got stories, buddy. Don't you remember when you were a kid and then this and then this and then this? And he's like, yeah, yeah, but I have it. Those are things that happened like with me and around me. But like, like I got hasn't done that in my prayers yet. I said, buddy, first of all, I'm 46. You're nine. You got time. But second of all, it starts because you say today, I'm going all in on your kingdom. And you start praying and seeking the face of God. Then you feel convicted. He's told me I got to do this. And so you go do it. I'm taking my two oldest to Mexico on the father-son trip, on a mission trip. When they found out about it, they said, yes, we want to go. And I tried to talk them out of it. I tried really, really hard. I was like, you don't understand. This isn't like trampoline park fun. This is like go to Mexico and paint some buildings and leave VBSs for kids. They're like, yeah, why wouldn't we go? I'm like, you don't understand. Like, it's going to cost money. And they're like, that's okay. Like, we'll get some. Like, yeah, I don't think you understand how that works. And you got, you're going to like be swinging a hammer. You're going to be tired and sore. And you're not going to sleep good. And you're going to be in a bunk bed. And, and like, you're gonna have to travel and, and I'm like, I'm doing everything I can to talk him out of it. And I go, dad, what is the point of our life? If we just sit around in our safe house and our safe community with our safe families and we never take a chance with Jesus. And just to be clear, God provided every stinking dollar that they needed through generous family members and friends who knew they were going. And I told them, I said, guys, I'm not worried about the money. God will take care of it. He always takes care of it. But the danger, yeah, thank you, you can give God the glory. The danger, the danger for all of us guys is that we will literally waste our life. In the book, Don't Waste Your Life, John Piper says this, I am wired by nature to love the same toys that the world loves. I start to fit in. I start to love what others love. I start to call earth home. And before you know it, I'm calling luxuries needs and using my money just the way unbelievers do. I begin to forget the war. I don't think much about the people perishing. Missions and unreached people drop out of my mind. I stop dreaming about the triumphs of grace. I sink into a secular mindset that looks first to what man can do, not what God can do. It is a terrible sickness. And I thank God for those who have forced me again and again toward a wartime mindset. Wartime is not, we're not talking about Ukraine or Russia or China or any of those. We're talking about a spiritual war that we briefly introduced last week. 
And John Piper, who's this pastor now, he's like, it's so easy for me to forget. There's a real battle raging all around us all the time. And if, if I don't pay attention, if I don't keep it top of mind, it will slip from my mind. So here's my challenge, my encouragement to all of you today. And I do not want to see you waste your life. I want your lives to count. I want you to get to your last day and you're not bringing Jesus a fleet of cars or houses or bank accounts or seashells. I want you to imagine that you're waking up tomorrow and you are like, what would it look like if tomorrow I just made sure I didn't waste my life, that I made it count, I made it mean something. Real quick story. So Friday, my, my kids and I, we had something to pick up. We gave my wife set a conference. So I got the boys and we're picking up something to play for. We're on our way back. And um, we've got some money and, and, and like from a gift card that some of you uh, gave us for when I had my surgery for Chick-fil-A. And I was really excited. And my mom calls on the way. She doesn't even know we're coming back. She's like, hey, can I buy you guys breakfast? And I'm like, slam dunk. It's all paid for. Yes, go. And so we're talking on the way on the back there. I'm just like, thank you, Grammy. Boys like, yeah, thank you, Grammy. It's awesome. We're super excited. And my mom says, you have time for a story? I said, yeah, tell me a story. And she's like, so she tells me a story. Now I gotta set the stage because all stories make sense in context, right? My dad owns his own business. And I didn't know this, but apparently it's been really tight. It's been a tough financial season. That can happen for a number of reasons, right? And so my dad's been working hard. My dad's theory is, you know, uh, I'm partnering with God at whatever he wants to do in the world, right? He calls him pennies from heaven. So I don't know what God's gonna provide next, but he's going to. And this has been the example he's shown me my whole life. So my dad had this like appointment set up. He was really hoping to close the sale. My dad's really good at closing the sale. And he showed up and it, he didn't close the sale and he's not sure anything's gonna come from it. He was feeling really down, like what's gonna happen? Now put that on pause for just a second because that's part of the story, but I gotta put that piece over here. Now my dad, um, he serves in, as an elder in the church I grew up in and has for years. And it, there's been some transition there and he's kind of helped to lead them through that. He's also, this, I just happened to put the shirt on, I didn't know it. He's also on the board at a place called the Canton Christian Home. That's what this is. It's a, it's a Christian retirement home. And um, it's down in Canton, Ohio. They live in, in, in Akron, Ohio. And it's been brutal. I mean, I'm talking and praying with my dad on a regular basis uh, three to six months ago as they're just trying to save and turn around this ministry. It's just struggling financially. He's carrying this tremendous weight. And in the middle of all of that, it pops up that nobody will step up to serve in the middle school kids at the church where he's an elder. So my mid-70s year old dad says, I got it. And I'm going, dad, no offense. These kids are gonna chew you up and spit you out. Like, no cap. You won't know what they're talking about. You will have no idea. They will look at you and call you sus and you'll be like, what? And those of you who have teenagers, no. You have no idea. No idea what you were in for. But he showed up Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. Many times he's like, man, I just got this question about demons. What would you say to this one? Man, I got this question about angels. What do you say about this one? And like, I'm trying to help my dad love these kids. He's taking them to horse farms and he's celebrating a kid's birthday. And I don't know where one of the grandparents of one of the kids calls him and wants to do business with him and it's gonna pay his bills for quite some time. Now, why do I tell that story? <laughs> Anytime you give your life to Jesus, you're never wasting your life. Jesus promises if you put my kingdom first, I'm gonna take care of all the rest. You don't have to worry about what you're gonna eat or what you're gonna wear, or shelter, or any of those other things. I'm gonna take care of those things. You put me first and I'll take care of all the other needs. So what you end up getting is me and everything else too. And I'm desperately afraid we're gonna show up with seashells in heaven and think we got it. I wanna show you one last thing. So I'm talking to my wife about all this last night. I'm starting to get real passionate and I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to temper my passion just for a minute because I, I'm afraid it won't be clear. And I wanna be clear. In the book of Isaiah, Isaiah the prophet is, is in a vision and we don't exactly know what that means. Is he literally in heaven or is he just seeing it and feeling it and experiencing it? We don't know. But he gets to see the heavenly courtroom and it's an amazing moment. Everybody is caught up in the glory of God. They can't help it. The angels are just singing out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is come. It's just this crazy awesome moment. And as they're singing these praises, Isaiah sees the, the temple from God's robe just fill the whole place with God's glory and he's overwhelmed in a moment. And God's like, I need someone to go. And it looks like he's talking to these angels angelic hosts. I need someone to go and do this thing. And Isaiah is caught up in Isaiah 6. He's like, here I am. Here I am. Send me. Send me. And what's really crazy is in that place, he says the Hebrew word, which means like, look, look, behold. 
Lo is one of the translations. I'm right here. I'm right here. Send me. Isaiah goes out and he serves the Lord and he proclaims the good news about Jesus and he warns the Israelites to repent and return to God that God wants to bless them, he wants to use them but they have hard hearts and they won't listen and they won't receive and they won't change and they won't do so by the time you get to the end of Isaiah it's just some really hard words from the Lord look, because you aren't doing these things here's what's gonna happen when we get to Isaiah 58 and Isaiah 58, God is telling Israel look, you come to me and you fast and you pray but you're not really in it You don't love me. And you wonder, you're mad at me. Why won't you listen to our prayers? The reason I'm not listening to your prayers is because you're just jumping through some religious hoops. I'm not a God who could be manipulated or controlled. I know what you're really all about. And then he just goes on verse after verse after verse. You wanna see me move? Go spend yourself on the poor. You wanna see me move? Go partner with me in what I'm doing in the world. You wanna see me move? Go set captives free. You wanna see me move? And then he says this, Isaiah 58. Then your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Nobody's going to sneak up on you because God's got your back. Then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help and he will say, Hinini. And then he'll say, here am I. You ah, just got to put these two pieces together. It's the same word in Isaiah 6 and the same word in Isaiah 58 verse 9 here. It's the same word in the Hebrew. And the reason is God's saying, when you do the things that I've asked you to do, what you will find is I am a ready servant, ready to go on your behalf and get done whatever you need done. When you put me first and my kingdom first, then I'll say, here I am, send me. Man, I want you to be able to tell stories to your kids and your grandkids for generation after generation after generation. And the only way we see that happen is we partner with whatever God is doing in this world. We say, because you say so, I'm in. I'm in. I don't know how it's going to work. I don't have the resources. I'm not smart enough. I can't figure it out, but I'm going to keep going forward. I'm going to say my next yes, God. Because you say so, here's my next yes. So here's my challenge to you. In front of you right now is a serve card. And I'll just tell you one of the ways that I'm calling you to partner with what God is doing in this world is to join us in serving right now. My wife got a phone call yesterday because we don't have enough nursery workers. I love my wife. She serves on the worship team and kids ministry. She's like, can I go rock babies? You okay with it? I'm like, yes, by all means. But my wife shouldn't be jumping over to serve in that ministry because we're short on people. We had 35 cards filled out last week. Praise God. Do you know we have a trend around here? We get cards filled out that we call and we email. And it's like, if I don't call back, it's like when somebody knocks at the door, right? And you're like, don't answer it. <laughs> Listen, church, I just want this message to mess with you. I know you're busy. I know you feel ill-equipped. So do I every day when I get up here on a Sunday. And I just found out the Sea of Galilee was called the Sea of Gennesaret. Who knew? Because All I have to give to you is whatever God gave to me. All you have to give to somebody else is what God gave to you. So pull out that card. Chelsea's gonna lead us in a song. Not lead us. I don't want you to sing. If you really know it and wanna sing, that's fine. I just want you to sit and take it in for a minute. Let God mess you up. Let God turn your dream upside down. I don't care if you've been here one week or 20 years. What are you waiting for? Let's pray. God, Do something in this place that can't be explained because I got excited. Do something in this place that can't be explained because I told a story. Do something in this place because your spirit has gone before us, God. You tell us to pray to the God of the harvest and you will raise up workers to send out into the field. So God, we're knocking on your door again. Would you raise up workers right now to send out, God? Raise up a church that 10 years from now, when we tell stories, we're gonna look back at 2023 right here on this Sunday, and we're gonna talk about what you did in our midst. And we're just gonna know, Hanini, you just said, here am I. God, we love you. Thank you for your abundant faithfulness to us. In Jesus' name, all God's people said.